there everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from thecreativepen.com and today I'm here with Jackie Penn, who is my mum. Hi mum. <laughs> Hi Jo, <laughs> thank you very much for inviting me to come on your, po it's your podcast isn't it? It is, yes. It is indeed. Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we're obviously, this is a bit weird for both of us today, um, but it's going to be really interesting, I think, for everybody. So just a little introduction before we get into the interview. So Jackie, my mum, worked as a teacher before moving into change management consultancy, working with Hewlett Packard Company in Idaho, Oregon, and California in the USA, as well as Europe and the Middle East. After retirement, Jackie renovated houses in New Zealand before moving back to the UK in 2011. And we have now co-written three books, three sweet romance novels as Penny Appleton. And here is one of the books, love second time around. And uh, today we're also, I mean, we're gonna talk about this today, but we are now stopping writing novels together as Penny Appleton. So we're gonna talk uh, a lot about what we've learned and also because mum is a new writer. So she's gonna share her, um, her thoughts on all of that so this is going to be brilliant so mum we get you know uh easy question to start with because I know people are going to be wondering like you've had a great career you could just be swanning around the world doing what you like but you've started again you're, you're writing so um what what do you love about writing what is it that has kept you already going for four books because you've done a non-fiction as well um what are the fun parts for you why do this Gosh, um, I think it's because I love learning and the fun of working with you on doing something like this. You, you've been going a long time now and you've made a great success of it. And I love the books that you've done. And also there's a nice feeling of when you actually hold your book in your hand. That, that first one that you showed there, the love second time around, um, it was the nice feeling of, taking stories from my past because they're actually based on me all three of them and my experiences and um seeing them come alive in a book and then having you help me make them into something you can be proud of really that was a very nice thing to do but I do enjoy learning and though I'm retired from my other jobs I think it keeps your brain alive to take on some challenges. And also I'm an introvert, so I much prefer to write and I've journaled all my life. So really writing was a, a very comfortable thing to do. And the fun was seeing it move from the written word on a page, you know, because I write by hand, um, to seeing it become a book. That was a magic thing. Yeah, and but I guess I have a question as well. So why do you think you didn't do this before? Why do you think, you know, because like it seems to me, having seen you go through this, that you are a natural writer, that actually that's what you should have been doing. Um, and you did drama at university a long time ago. Um, so you have that storytelling uh, side of you. So what do you think are some of the things that might have stopped you writing before? I think it was because of drama and teaching. You put a huge amount of your creativity into teaching and facilitating young people to express themselves. I, I did a lot of uh, production of plays, producing plays. So my creativity was going into that, really, that, that the kids I worked with were writing. They were doing GCSE and O-levels, and my job was to help them to write creatively. So I didn't write them. The other thing was I was bringing you and your brother up. <laughs> As a single mum, we should say. Yeah. And um, that's a very busy job. If you're working full time and then you've got two children who bring homework home and, you know, need to be taken to basketball and stuff like that, you don't have much time to write. Um, and I've also been a painter. So my creativity went into painting. And I think the last thing was that this was your thing. You became a writer and you were making your way in the world and in, and in indie publishing. And it was like, well, keep your nose out on Joe's patch for a bit. You can go and do loads of other things. But then when you became successful, then I wasn't challenging you. You've become the expert who's coached me that's what's been so exciting 
then you're going to talk about family doing stuff together in a minute but that's been a very re- unique thing for me joe is not to be the mum and the parent and the teacher but actually to be the learner so i think i didn't write because i was doing drama because i was teaching because i was bringing up youngsters but i always have written a diary but that's not really publishable to it <laughs> <laughs> no, no. And it, but it's it's interesting. I think um you know, you've always been a reader, so you've always read lots and we've always had books in the house. So I was always brought up with books and um but what was funny and I don't know if you remember this. I think oh, well we've talked about it since. But when I wrote one of my first books and you read it and you said, um why don't you write something nice like Hillary Mantel? <laughs> you remember that? I do. Yes, that's that's the sort of mother saying, "Why don't you get a proper job?" Bit. <laughs> but it, but then what was so um, what was really great for me was when you actually said once you were writing, you were like, "Oh, this is hard." So you you had this kind of renewed respect for what it meant. So and that was surprising for you, I think, wasn't it? You were you were surprised by how hard it was. It was because Rod, your brother, said, oh, well, you've been an English teacher. It's going to be easy for you. And I said, no, 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 no. This is a whole different ball game. Um, it's, it's partly, if you look at traditional publishing, you actually start with a story and then an editor takes it. And then if they like it, they tell you thousands of things you have to change. And then there's loads of people get input into it. But when you're doing indie publishing like you are, there's a, a whole range of professionalisms you have to learn, don't you? So you see the whole process from the time you write the story through to analysing who is your audience, how much is it going to cost to actually get it out there, who are you publishing it with, um, and then how do you market it? There's, it's a whole different world. So writing a story in your English class, your fiction class, is very different from actually publishing it and and saying and and I think you made the distinction you asked me do you do you want to write this so you can see your name on a book so that you can say I wrote this book you know and I said no I don't actually want to see my name on it and just in case it's rubbish (laughs) so the first one was written under Jay Ryman wasn't it because um being Jackie I was often called Jay the letter J and then as I was walking past Ryman's the stationers down in Bristol I thought that's a nice name so I wrote the funeral book the first one the non-fiction under Jay Ryman to close off a particular aspect of of being a funeral um celebrant yeah <laughs> that's right and um and then when we looked at Penny Appleton, we, we looked at a whole different thing, didn't we? If it was going to be a sweet romance, what would the names be and things? So you, you said, do I want just to have this book as for pleasure or do I want to try and make a commercial success of it? And I said, well, I've really loved doing the painting. I don't know if you remember this, but nobody ever bought them. <laughs> <laughs> or a few people did, but it wasn't exactly, a, you know, no, it cost because, you money. You know, it was a hobby. <laughs> You look at the cost of paint and canvases, I got great pleasure out of it, but actually it was very expensive, you know. And then when I retired, I thought, I can't afford to do this much anymore. So with the books, I thought we'd love to write, but wouldn't it be fabulous if they were good enough for somebody else to buy as well? So that's that's what it was, that was what it was about really. Um, and no, I didn't want to see my name on the book. And you're still not going to use your name. I, I guess we'll come we'll come to that in a minute. But I do want to just circle back on the English teaching because I actually think I think that English literature studying English literature can actually hold back the storytelling. Do you do you do you think that? I do. Yes. If you look at one of my favourite books and particularly movies is Pride and Prejudice but actually you read Jane Austen's style and it's completely stultifying for the 21st century much easier to see it in in film than it is now to study Jane Austen or Dickens I mean look at Dickens's stories are fabulous but you wouldn't look at his language and his writing now because it's not relevant Mm. to your with writing today you're looking at well people reading today are very different they want it faster. They want it in little chunks. You you can't have great big long paragraphs of description because it's got to be much more vis- vis- you know, visual. So I actually think, yes, the study of some English literature is 
I think you can. I used to teach um, story writing and use bits of classical writers, and and also Tolkien and people like that. But yeah, I think it can be if it's taught in a way that says you've got to write like this. Um, it doesn't help. Mm. And I guess what what are any of the other things that you that surprised you about writing the novels particularly? Because I think the nonfiction, you know, you were you were a consultant, you know how to write a document. And nonfiction, you wrote a document, we edited it, it, we, it came out. Um, and for everyone listening, that is How to Plan a Funeral by Jay Ryman, <laughs> and it's an excellent book if you uh, <laughs> if you need to plan a funeral. <laughs> everyone needs this at yes. some. Oh, there it is. How to plan a funeral. And it is a super useful book, but th there's a big difference between here's everything I know about how to plan a funeral, which you wrote. Obviously, we had a death in the family and um, you, you studied that. But a novel is completely different. So what, what else surprised you about, about the novel? I think if we looked at all three, what surprised me was you want it to be handleable. So you're not just looking at, at the novel itself, but focusing on the reader rather than the author. So <laughs> if you remember rightly, my first version of Love Second Time Around was 90,000 words. And you said, not bad, mum, there's some gem among, gems amongst the rubbish. Um, <laughs> I, I don't went, think I ever said rubbish. You said, crap. you said, there's some gems amongst the crap, mother. I think you actually put it in writing. Um, but it's, it's 90,000 words, you've got to cut 40,000 words out. And I kind of went, oh, my baby. <laughs> I just sweated over writing that. And she wants me to cut it in half. And um, <laughs> so that was that was a good learning that you, if you want a book that's going to be that thick, like J.K. Rowling, then you're going to have to maybe hit a market that you know will take that. But for our, our, my kind of books, the kind of novel, the sweet novel, romance, someone wants to, to get into bed and read a chapter and then be hooked into saying, you know, let's read another chapter before I go to sleep. Oh, oh, well, you know, I would like to read another chapter. And, and they eat it like a bag of chips or, you know, a bar of chocolate. And at the end, they put it down and they go, that was great. I really enjoyed that. So there's a whole different way of writing the novel than, as you say, the non-fiction. Really. Mm. And then you genre. So what was fun about working with you again was you used to send me loads of books, kind of like how to write a romance or how to structure your novel. Or I had one here that you – oh, this one helped a lot. Oh, you have to hold it up, up, up a bit. Sorry. Oh, look, the successful author mindset by your daughter, <laughs> dedicated yeah, to my mum. really <laughs> struggling. and. Um, you sent this and it was lovely. Uh, I, and I've written in the front. I've, um, I've written this. This I love this book, not just because Joe dedicated to me, which is nice, but what she said, it really, really helps. So you can see lots of my corners are turned over. Oh, where it's dark. And then I go, well, Joe's been there. She's 10, 11 years now ahead of me on the journey. Um, I'll go and see what she said about this. Oh, oh, that's nice. So instead of phoning you, panic-stricken and miserable, like I used to, <laughs> and you say, just stop, Mum, go and go and have a break, you know, go for a walk, don't get yourself anymore. I would go to that, and then um, you sent me two, two more. This is Character Arcs. Oh, Creating Character Arcs by K.M. Wylands, isn't it? Yep, and that helped me a lot with my characters. I didn't, never understood what what you meant I used to say look at the arc of the character I think what is she talking about and then this was really helpful and then this is um this is stunning but probably still a bit too advanced for me this is the the story grid by Sean Coyne so for those of you on the audio mum is holding up the books that are good for her and yeah the story grid um by the lovely Sean Coyne um is about it's really pretty hardcore, isn't it? But I think every time you read it, you can get something else from it. I think this is for life, really. This is an encyclopedic knowledge of everything you need to know as a good editor. And as you start to write, if you think, well, I'm also editing my own work, 
and frankly more effort and pain goes into the editing or it did for me anyway does that happen with you well I think you I think over time it changes um and you your I mean what we found that and I, I want to just circle back on the cutting down that first novel part, uh, yes. part of part, I should just explain to people like part of the reason we did Penny Appleton is you said oh I, I, I don't uh, remember how it started but you wrote a book and I had not even considered publishing with you but then I read the book and I realized that there was a sweet romance in there but it did need to be excavated a little. Um, but when I read it, I was like, I could see this going out there. And the reviews have been amazing on Love Second Time Around. You know, it really is a mature romance, sweet romance, because you're my mum. There's just a kiss. That's it. You know, <laughs> just so everybody knows, you just don't talk about other things with your mum. <laughs> well, um, what, was, what was good was with sweet romance was I said to you, well, I'm, I'm 70 now, so I can't remember what sex was all about. And I can't write as 50 shades of grey. And you said, well, I wouldn't want to read it anyway, you know. And so I said, well, what else could you write? And you said, well, sweet romance stops at the bedroom door. It's about relationships. Um, it's got some, it's got a lot of, fe- of affection and feelings in it, but it doesn't go into the graphic detail, you know. So there's a lot of readers who like that. Oh, yeah, definitely. And it's actually a very fast growing um, niche. I also think that um, you did find the writing cathartic in a way. So Mm. um, Love, Home at Last, uh, you know, you wrote about the death of of your uh, Bobby, uh, your beloved yep. Bobby dog. And um, I th- I mean, that, that a very emotional scene and I know it was hard for you. So how, how can writing help the cathartic emotional stuff for the writer? Very much, Joe, actually, because I did write about, and I had a German Shepherd dog who I had for 12 years, and he had to be put down at the end. So he was all right, but his back legs collapsed. And I think any pet owner goes through that feeling of, I don't want him to suffer, yet I can't bear to lose him. And when you hold your animal in, in your arms and they give them the injection and suddenly their spirit is gone, that was very tough for me. And like losing my mum and dad, you know, he really was a member of the family. So when I wrote about it the first time, it lifted the pain because I went through it again and I remembered and I looked at all these photographs and I made him a photo book. But you said when I put it into Love Home at Last, it's it's in that book there, you, you said when I write about my character's who have got dogs and horses and animals in their lives, the characters come alive because it's me talking. You hear me through the words. And um, I think you sent me a message saying you just read the bit where Bobby has to be put to sleep again and cried a second time, you know, they've got you the second time as well. So I think as a writer, it is a very cathartic thing. You're put, I think you call it emotional beats. Do you, you, you put a emotion in a particular part, it illuminates the character of the person you're talking about. It, it has a part in the action. It moves the story forward because in, in this book, Lizzie and Harry are united over the, over the issues of animals and things. So, yeah, very cathartic. Um, yeah. Go on. Yeah, I think, and that's what I've really enjoyed seeing. And I think one of, you know, let's talk now about the challenges of of working together. So we are very good friends um, as mother and daughter. um, And in many ways, we're similar. Like a lot of people would say, oh, our characters are quite similar. Um, But I think what the writing has shown to me, because you've read some of my fiction and you have said before, I can't read this, I get nightmares. Um, You know, I've given you, I feel like I've traumatized you over some things I've written. And and now, um, and then I read what you've written. And it's, it's, I actually think reading someone else's fiction is a very, is far more intimate than reading someone's non-fiction. What do you think? Totally agree. When I when I first read your thrillers, I thought, who is this child? This, is, this doesn't belong to me, does it? Is this, is this what I brought up? She's like Bram Stoker, my goodness. And uh, you said, you said something like, yes, but I put all 
all that part of me, that alter ego, the black side of me, the dark side of me, into the into the books. And I thought, yeah, that's probably right because in lots of ways, um, I'm just a wimp, you know, whereas you're very, very tough. And there's, that's really admirable, you know. So, yeah, it does come out in different sorts of fiction, doesn't it? And I eventually could no longer read your books, you know, not because they're nasty, but because they made me – I couldn't get sleep. You know, I'd be thinking, oh, Morgan's down in this cavern. And it's full of skulls, and oh. <laughs> that's why they're called thrillers. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Right, but it's not my genre. And, and so this was, and this is really. Um, uh, let's just talk now about why we're stopping Penny Appleton because this yeah. is the heart of it. I read the fourth book, um, which you'll, will come out at some other point under another name. And when I read that fourth book, I I really had this real feeling. Th- you, that your voice has become stronger so your individual writing voice is stronger now you know what you're doing and also I feel like this is not my genre like I what I was trying to change your book into was not the work we we are not natural co-writers together and I was not acting as a good editor and I said to you um I would not accept the comments that I'm trying to give you from an editor therefore we can't do this anymore. And it was a tough, a tough discussion, right? But I think in some way you felt the same. You, you kind of understood that, right? So, so, so uh, tell us, how, how was that for you? Like, how have you been feeling about that? I was actually quite relieved because when you sent it back and said, well, there's some radical changes got to happen here, I actually thought it was the best piece of work I'd sent you so far. But because you are so experienced, it's almost like we've been on a tandem bicycle and I've been so privileged to have you on the front guiding the bicycle and being able to pedal behind and learn so much. Joe, I've learned so much over the last two years. It's really been fabulous. I've said to friends, I can't believe that my daughter would give me this amount of time to help me grow and develop, because you're really a great coach and mentor to a lot of people, actually. You've been involved with helping a lot of writers grow, haven't you? But when you when it's actually a member of your family. So when we first started writing, I thought to myself, if Jo's going to put this time in, whatever she tells me, there's no arguing, no, oh, but I want to do it this way, because she'll just say, well, push off and do it. <laughs> She hasn't got time, and it takes a lot of time editing someone's work. So the first book, you did a huge amount of work on to help me structure, to say this bit's good, but it needs to be here, and you need to put this bit here, and there's a bit here that's totally missing, and you're still missing your character tags. You know, this person arrives on the scene, and I have no idea what they look like or where they are. So I'm still doing that, but... In tandem, eventually, I was beginning to think, well, you know, I should be riding on my own now, and I'm ready to ride on my own. And actually, I know as much as I have. You've given me confidence to ride my own bicycle, and we ride two very different bicycles. So we've kind of been going along, and now you said to me, I might as well just rewrite this whole book if I'm going to do this. So it's, it's time to stop. Mm. how much time you've taken out of your own writing to give me the confidence to say I love doing this I'm going to go on doing it whether you're with me or not I don't know what will happen with it but um, I definitely think it's time to part ways now Mm. and it's been like I've learned a lot too I think from when like I as you say I've been writing now I started writing 12 12 years ago and uh you know I've written a lot of books and it becomes difficult to almost see see what you know and what I learned from and we we are officially co-writing because I did we did co-write those three books I wasn't just editing we were really co-writing um and I learned a lot about 
almost what I know um, by doing that. And I actually ended up doing a course on how to write a novel, really based on what what we were going through. Because what I realised, and I know, like, for example, I sent you that story grid book quite early on, and that was that it was too early to send you the story grid. I mean like you did a very good job of reading through it and then kind of going okay I'll just take a step back and look at some other things and then return to it but that um I think I you know I've learned a lot from that but also I'm I'm just thrilled because uh you know you used to write poetry right a long time ago maybe you still do uh, but you <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> but I remember reading some of your poetry when I was maybe 15 14 15 something like that where did you find that where did you probably find in it? a drawer <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but but I remember thinking you know my mum my mum's a writer you know and I think that must have had some impact you know as in I I had in my mind that writers were a long way away but you were an English teacher at the time and so that and we did have books around and that so that clearly made a big impact but it's been so interesting to see like for example the point of view thing I know people will find this interesting because I was like you you need to you need to do a third person point of view and and it's almost like you couldn't understand that because it, it it was like a until you understand it you don't understand it it's just a thing oh. right I, uh, you asked me once, you know, what books do I like most? And the, the odd thing is I seem to like young teens. Young work, adult, like, yeah, you like young adult like work. Twilight, the Twilight series and The Hunger Games, and they're written in third, first, first person, point of view of the heroine. And I thought with my first book, it would be nice, wouldn't it, to, to write it from the point of view of an older hero, hero, heroine. Sorry. Um, so it's actually written from from Maggie's point of view. And that's really my voice it started off with and the stories that had happened with that older person. So we're writing from Maggie's point of view and it's her view of Greg and her view of what happened. And then when you co came in and co-wrote, you added a whole different depth to her that wasn't me. And you said it's time to go past autobiographical stuff and make it more relevant to other older readers as well which was great um so the point i thought well that's the point of view isn't it and you said no third person point of view written in the past makes it so much more flexible and then in this fourth book you said i can't, I can't edit this because you've now written it from two points of view the female point of view is chapter one um and the second chapter is the male point of view and I thought this is fascinating I'm, I'm doing a great piece of innovation here I have it slung back at me and told <laughs> I, I was well, not no. Let's just be clear. In that, there are books where the first chapter is first person, second chapter is another person in first, both of them written in first person. But it's again, because of the genre I come from, it's written in the third person with the name, you know, Morgan was down the crypt with the skulls. Uh, and you and you write with the I and I'm not I don't naturally write with the I voice. It's just the first person voice. So again, it's like a huge difference between us just in the way we naturally write. And so I want everyone listening to really hear this is that there is a natural way that you end up writing and what you prefer and I think you've you've felt you feel that voice much more now yes but now that when you sent back this fourth book and said about the third person past tense point of view I've rewritten the first three chapters in the way that you've suggested and it does mean it's much more versatile. So mm. where bit that just doesn't work for David, and really it should be in chapter three, I can't easily move it without completely rewriting it. But at the time I was doing it, I thought I was being awfully sophisticated. Oh, this is such a cool, cool way to do it. You know, it's most unusual. And it is most unusual, but I think you have to be almost like, you know, the level of the English patient writing really you know and a very very experienced and sophisticated writer could could do this but <laughs> a newbie couldn't <laughs> so very good feedback yeah well really yeah really interesting okay so let's um let's just move on to the family thing so um 
obviously we love each other very much we're friends but we also drive each other quite crazy <laughs> sometimes because we are quite similar we're both strong women and uh you know and we we can both be very strong let's just leave it at that um but what but what are some of the um if people but i know and i obviously i work with jonathan my husband i've helped dad um and you're obviously for everyone listening my parents are divorced but i helped my dad separately do a book um and you know i've i've helped my um my niece in new zealand do a book and i you know i tr i have tried to help family members because we do that because we love people right and but there are challenges so and i like for example i wouldn't do another book with my dad <laughs> <laughs> for very different reasons than working with you. You've been a dream, really. But what, what are some of the challenges or recommendations for people listening who want to help their mum or they want to help their dad or their brothers and sisters or their, their love partners? You know, what, what are some of the ways you can balance love and also um, help, helping in a pr really practical way? I think it's not so much about love as about respect. So, I and, and also establishing who's in the lead. So, one person, say you're going to help your daughter or you're going to help your mum, then you have to set the ground rules up. The ground rules for you and I were you were established as a writer and an indie publisher. I was a complete newbie and I listened to what you had to say and I had no experience in that field. So I just did everything that you said. And I didn't challenge you, I didn't turn around and say, no, well, I don't want to do it like that. Because I, we had that respect. I respect you very much for what you do. So I think that's important, respect and setting some ground rules. And a maybe a time limit or, or some definition, some boundaries as to what you're going to do. Uh, I think one of the reasons we have stopped now is also that I haven't been very well over the last six months or so. And being a professional writer, you work to deadlines, got to. Um, so I've been unhappy because I haven't been able to keep up with the de deadline. And I felt, now I need to let that go with Jo because now I'm impacting on her, the way, her business, really. So there's love. But there's also respect, and my respect for you said it's time to do my own thing in my own time while I get well again and to let, let Joe go now. And thank you very much indeed. So if you're working with a family member, I think it's respect, setting boundaries, and who is in the lead. Mm. And I do like the metaphor of the tandem bicycle and then heading off on your own bicycles because I think part of it is I do feel like you can go off on your own. Like I have you know I'm going to help you with some of the technical side around the publishing like I did with with the funeral book but it will be on your Amazon account it you know it will be your bank account you will that will still be your your side of things um with the new book so I feel that respect too is that you know and you know I wouldn't have said I wouldn't have carried on or wouldn't have encouraged you so much if I didn't think you actually had something there <laughs> well that was lovely too really was that I knew you wouldn't. If you said, well, that was good, mum, first book was good, but, you know, you really haven't got the ability to tell a story. What you said was, you have, you could. Is this fun for you? Because there's also a lot of heartache and exhaustion and frustration. You know, I press the wrong key and the whole bloody computer goes down. <laughs> no, no, I get on the phone and say, I've lost, I've lost the whole novel. You know, and she said, no, don't panic, don't panic, there's Google in the corner. Um, so there have been a lot of downs as well as ups when you think, I can't do this, I can't do this, and I can't be bothered doing this. And then the next day, you wake up in the morning and it's like an addiction, it's nagging at you. So this fourth book that we've talked about, I've I've written and rewritten that three times now and part of me is fed up with it and the other part of me says I've put too much work into this and the two characters Claire and David I actually are actually real I can't leave them there now mm. they, they need to be finished and I need to be able to say like Maggie and Greg their story has been told um so that's I think it's the addiction that keeps you going isn't it? <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, so we, we're almost out of time, but let, let's just talk about your writing process now because I think one of your um, strong points is dialogue, and I wonder how much that is to do with your process. So explain your process. Okay. Um, I hear voices in my head. I hear my characters talking to each other, and I always take a spiral-bound notebook with me everywhere in my bag and some nice pens. Um, I find some pens that I really like and put them in my bag. So I might be going along and I hear these voices in my head talking about a particular situation. So I write the dialogue, but then I'm not very fast on the computer. I prefer pen. So I have a, um, I've got it here to show you. I've got a dictaphone, a Sony top of the range dictaphone. There it is. Um, there, there are various prices, but this one is the most expensive, if anyone is interested. And you plug it straight from the dictaphone into the computer, and it goes via the Dragon software, it goes voice to text. So I'll maybe come back with my spiral bound notebook with um, here. So that's page 44 of what I was working on yesterday, you know. Mm -hmm. So there's a load of things that I'm writing, then I'll come back and read it into the dictaphone, then immediately plug it into the computer, put it on Dragon, and it comes up on the screen. And then I'll disconnect, and then I'll edit. Because often you've repeated something, or so, and I edit it straight away, and then I move it from Dragon into the, the chapters of, of where it's going to go. So that's a very strong process for me because it means I don't have to spend hours typing. I think that I could be sitting here for four hours, but I'd get slower and worse as I went along. So I don't allow myself to stay more than an hour and a half sitting down. Um, we've got thrombosis in the family. My auntie had thrombosis. And so I have a kitchen timer and I put it on for 90 minutes. And then I, I have a, <laughs> I have my machine that I stand on. It's called um, a riveter. Oh, know? there we go. <laughs> it's a circulation booster. It is. And what it does is it vibrates your legs. You put your feet on it and it rocks them back and, back and forward. And it sends, a lot of gyms are doing it now. They wire you up and an electric Oh, yeah. It's not quite the same as the gym vibration platform. <laughs> It's quite, it's, it's no, I, I've been on one of those. You wouldn't be able to do anything. <laughs> no, all right. It's not as strong as that. But you can, I have it at a low level nearly all the time when I'm sitting here. And I've got another one now, which is for my waistline. <laughs> <laughs> so I haven't tried that yet. I can say that I've worked on the Revative um, probably for six months now. And the backs of my legs are not as fat as they were. I had fat calves. And I do think I'm, I'm not getting cramped. In my legs so it's important for me not to spend too long here I have a standing up desk as well um, but to be able to get my thoughts onto the computer as fast as possible then edit and then spend my time when I'm here actually moving stuff about or editing as opposed to I don't type yeah, I think that's and I think that's why your dialogue is so strong because you're speaking it so much. And I think it's great because that's how you've written all the three books and you're carrying on that way and it's a great way to learn. Um what I uh, I'd also say just for everyone we've used Google Docs because mum did try Microsoft Word and we did have a few dilemmas with losing things. So in the end I said, look, let's use Google Docs because uh, a second after you type into Google Docs it's backed up in the cloud. So even though mum has felt Sometimes she's lost it. I log on because we share all the documents and I can see that it's not lost. So even though you're writing on your own from now on, maybe we'll continue doing that. <laughs> I think that'd be a good idea. <laughs> Just in case, because, you know, every, and I know I've had so many emails from people who've lost manuscripts. So having a process where it is backed up in, in a way is, is a really good idea. And the other thing with my written, handwritten stuff like that, until I've finished the book, I don't throw those notes away. I staple them together and I stick them in a black box in the other room. And it plus it's got loads of photographs. Sometimes I, part of the process is being able to see the faces of the people that you're writing about. And so I find pictures and stick them in here too. Um, and that helps my process. And that's, so fun, that's really fun as well. Yeah, I love doing that. Um, and then I keep those. 
so that if it does disappear off the computer, I can back and write it again. <laughs> You've still got it all, exactly. No, that's awesome. Okay, so then we have to ask, what is next? So what do you, I mean, we are at the beginning of your next phase. So we're doing this discussion at the end of Penny Appleton. So um, what, do, and you, this might change, but tell us, what are you feeling like you're, you're going to do next? Obviously, you've got the books going. Um, what are you feeling about the name? Uh, you know, tell us what's next. I want to finish that book four, but I'm now going to be doing it through Jay Ryman, who's what we've already got established on Amazon. And I've changed it a bit because Jay Ryman was a funeral celebrant. It's the next three, and they're going to be three sweet romances based around three slightly more mature couples. And those people will be on a, like, I don't know if people have heard of Saga, which is a a uh, travel company for over 55s, I think. Mm. So it's all the singles meeting on those kind of holidays because that often happens. All the singles often meet on those kind of things. So yeah, I have every intention of doing at least another six books, Joe, but under Jay Ryman. Fantastic. So um, Jay Ryman doesn't have a website yet, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a, uh, a link. So whenever people are watching this or listening to this interview, if you go to thecreativepen.com forward slash mum, spelt with the <laughs> English spelling of M-U-M, that is going to take you to mum's books. So basically they're not out there. I mean, you can go to Penny Appleton at the moment, that link will go to Penny Appleton. Um, but they, they will eventually go, um, to the Jay Wyman books and I'll keep that updated Ooh, um, thank you, dear. over time. Yeah. So you can see mum's books. Um, so that is fantastic. I'm, I'm very excited. That was a lot of fun. Thank you for asking me. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's been great. And I know, um, Everyone, everyone will find this really useful because I think uh, beginning again, I, I, maybe let's end on this because there are some people who are listening who will think that starting again at 68, 70, it's, it, you know, should you bother? Um, so tell me what, like. <laughs> um, the whole thing about getting dementia is you don't get it if you keep your brain active. So whatever you choose to do when you finished your standard job, you need to be keeping your mind alive and your body alive. So it doesn't matter if it's writing or it's not, but if you love writing, then design your holidays around your writing. Uh, go to writer's groups. You very kindly, since you're dumping me in the drink now. You've involved <laughs> gently, me. gently setting you free <laughs> in the ocean. I'm wobbling a bit on my bicycle here, Joe, but <laughs> you have at least um, enrolled me in a creative fiction writing class, haven't you, for October? so that I'll be with another group of other writers and with another teacher who can read my stuff. Because I think it's jolly hard to edit your own Yeah, you can't work. edit your own work. No. Very hard to be able to see it. Um, but why carry on doing it? Well, I'd like to live actively and keep on learning until the moment I leave the planet, really. And this is a great way to do it. I'm, I read differently. I watch movies differently. Like there was a really good documentary on, on rom-coms on, on iPlayer a couple of nights ago. And I'm sitting there writing notes going, oh, my goodness, at the 25%, they've done that. And you look at it, and they have indeed. They've brought that particular thing at the 25%. So can I do it in the novel? And would any company like Harlequin like to buy my novels to make them into rom-coms? You know? So it's just a whole exciting world there, isn't there? And you look at books differently when you are writing a bit I suppose a bit like playing an instrument once you start to learn to play an instrument you listen differently you practice your scales and the same as writing anything you think oh, look at that that's that's not good and then you read someone who is writing really well and it's stunning and you now know what it took to get to that level of expertise but it's a journey isn't it and when I first First of all, I don't want to do this. I don't want to tread on Joe's area. But what you've said to me is we're all on the same journey. We're just at different points along it. So we can share that experience without in any way being in competition. Yeah, especially as we write in such different genres. <laughs> so fantastic look that was great mum I know people are gonna love it and if people if, if people want to um 
uh, comment on this. I'd suggest people comment on the episode um, or the uh, penny at pennyappleton.com email address is fine. Yep. Um, but that's going to be the best way if anyone's got any comments or feedback. So thanks so much, Mum. That was amazing. <laughs> Pleasure, Joe. Thank you for having me on your podcast. Bye, everybody.